Good, good morning, everybody. Um, the Liberal Democrats have always been an open and internationalist party. Indeed, we founded Liberal International just over 70 years ago to fight for freedom and liberalism across the world. We understand, perhaps better than many others, in the Brexit debate that there are too many issues in our lives that go well beyond the borders of our country. Um, we know and understand the, the importance of the EU to our economy, but it's much more important than that. It's not by chance that the NATO summit is here next week. We also know that the peace and security that we have had since 1945 across most of Europe is absolutely vital. And it's really important that there are people out there saying it at the moment that this country turns, appears to turn its back through our current prime minister on looking at anything beyond our borders. But the other big issue that is of extreme concern to Liberal Democrats is climate change, which doesn't follow borders either. And I think here we need to recognize again the importance of the European Union, where countries have come together to work over many years uh, to make sure that we can start mitigation. And to think that by leaving the EU, we can somehow put up barriers to stop climate change is just a complete nonsense. So that's why I'm particularly proud to introduce our Shadow Secretary for Foreign Affairs, who is absolutely committed to our internationalist agenda. Chaka Umana, you are very, very welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the club for hosting us. Um, of course, we share some of the same colors, uh, more <laughs> Lib Dem yellow than um, Labour red. Uh, but it's fantastic to be here. Next Wednesday, NATO heads of state and government will gather not far from here to mark the 70th anniversary of the organization. Founded in 1949, this intergovernmental military alliance of 29 European countries and the US has sought to safeguard the freedom and security of its members. It has been one of the linchpins of the liberal international rules-based order established in the wake of the Second World War to spread liberal democracy across the globe and guard against authoritarianism and oppression. The UK was instrumental in establishing this order and NATO itself. It was Winston Churchill who signed the Atlantic Charter of 1941 on behalf of the UK, which set out the framework of this order, its aims and its values. Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevin played pivotal roles, pivotal roles in the founding of NATO. We should be proud of this. Other institutions which facilitate the multilateralism, which is essential to maintaining this order, include the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, and of course, the European Union. So this is a fitting moment to say something about what the Liberal Democrats' approach would be in the next parliament to the Liberal International Rules-Based Order, NATO, and UK foreign policy because UK voters have a choice to make at this election. Give a majority to Boris Johnson, a man who is determined to take us out of the European Union, who has chosen to align with right-wing authoritarian nationalist forces who are opposed to the liberal international rules-based order, or elect as many Liberal Democrat MPs as possible, necessary to deprive Johnson of a majority and ensure the arithmetic in a new House of Commons can deliver a people's vote and pave the way to secure not only Britain's place at the heart of Europe, but as a world leader too. The situation is pressing, it is urgent, and we've got just, 20, just 17 days to do it. Let me start by underlining our commitment to NATO, which has been a cornerstone of the defense of our country. Alongside our fellow NATO ally France, we are the most capable military power in Europe. Our intelligence gathering capacity remains indispensable. Our membership of the Five Eyes Intelligence Partnership makes us a global leader in the fight against terrorism. And in NATO, 
Britain holds the position of Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe. Long may that continue. But NATO must reform and adapt to the changing nature of the threats we face. For example, we need to increase NATO's conventional deterrent and help develop the application of artificial intelligence. Cybersecurity is, after all, a tier one threat now, and Britain has a key role to play in the integration of internal security and external defense to meet the new challenges of hybrid warfare. Above all, we must provide credible deterrent that convince others that NATO is committed to Europe's collective defense. This is why Liberal Democrats will ensure the UK upholds our NATO responsibilities, including by spending 2% of GDP on defence. Under Liberal Democrats in government, this 2% will be worth 993 million more in 2025 to 2024 than under a Tory government, because using the Remain bonus, we will enhance the UK's ability to play our part in NATO and maintain our security. In so doing, we will ensure the men and women in our armed forces have the support and resources they need to do their jobs. However, it is alarming that other NATO members' commitment to the alliance is less than fulsome. US President Trump described NATO as obsolete during his 2016 presidential campaign. President Macron quite rightly cited Trump's failure to consult NATO allies before his abrupt decision to pull forces out of northern Syria is evidence of the US's commit, waning commitment to the alliance. This in turn paved the way for Turkey, another NATO member, to start an offensive into Syria to create what they called a security zone along its border. And consequently, out of some exasperation, President Macron described NATO as brain dead and warned European countries that we can no longer rely on America to defend NATO allies. No one is more happy to see this state of affairs than President Putin of Russia, an active opponent of NATO, which suspended contact with his government over the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Of course, President Putin, President Erdogan of Turkey, and Trump not only share a poor regard for NATO, they share a certain type of politics, right-wing, conservative, nationalist, and authoritarian. It is Trump, perhaps more than any other, who has taken this politics mainstream in the Western world. In his words and deeds, he has been unafraid to engage in bigoted, racist, sexist, and Islamophobic behavior, to lie, and to break the law. All the same criticisms apply to the UK's Prime Minister, who is following the Trump playbook and has become part of this global network of populist right-wing authoritarian nationalists. I do not need to repeat the various offensive things the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has said about different groups in our society. His capacity to lie, even to our Queen, is there for all to see. He unlawfully sought to shut down our legislature, he refuses to publish a parliamentary intelligence and security report into Russian state interference into our democracy, in spite of the fact a former Conservative Attorney General chairs the committee, a former head of MI5, the former National Security Advisor, and a former head of the Civil Service all say it should be published. What does he have to hide? What is he hiding in this report from the British public? It is all very Trumpian. This should not be a surprise. We know that before this election, Boris Johnson was regularly in touch with and took advice from Steve Bannon, the man who was instrumental in seeing Trump and his unedifying brand of politics into the White House. On Johnson taking office, Trump lauded him as Britain Trump. Indeed, it was Trump who gave the order that the UK's Conservative and Brexit parties should form an electoral pact. Nigel Farage obliged, and so it has come to pass, with Farage now claiming yesterday that the 20, 2019 Tory manifesto is a copy of UKIP's 2015 offer. So giving Johnson a majority would be to give carte blanche to this type of politics in the UK, something that should worry us all and should be strongly resisted. As British patriots, we have got to defend our liberal internationalist progressive values, British values, 
in the face of this politics of hate and division, which is distinctly un-British. Now, of course, our partnership with the US, our closest ally, is bigger than one man and will endure in spite of Trump. It is a partnership that has defined the West's foreign policy, forged in two world wars, the Cold War, and more recently in the fight against Islamic extremism. It is often described as special. The truth is the relationship is neither special nor is it sentimental, but it is based on hard-headed national interests. Our mutual sharing of intelligence, intelligence and the interoperability of our nuclear submarine forces makes it more than just a transaction. Our Army, Navy and Air Force are designed to fight alongside the US in a supporting role. The relationship gives us security and it amplifies our capabilities across the world. We are very much committed to it for that reason. Yet Britain cannot settle for just being a useful component of US foreign and defense policy. As Attlee remarked to Bevin in a cabinet meeting discussing the nuclear deterrent, we ought not to give the Americans the impression that we cannot get on without them, for we can, and if necessary, we will do so. In this, our EU membership has been key. We have not only acted as a bridge between the EU and the US, but our membership of the EU has acted as a useful counterweight in our relationship with the US. Now this delicate balance is under threat. Not only will we cease to be that important bridge between the EU and the US, but by withdrawing from the EU, inevitably Johnson will become more reliant on Trump in the short term if he is re-elected. Johnson is desperate to secure a US trade deal to make up for the damage done to our global standing if Brexit happens. From my own contact with the US government, it is clear a high price will be extracted and close alignment with US rules and regulations will be demanded. So we risk becoming a vassal state of the US if Boris Johnson gets a majority. Leave the EU and the UK under Johnson will become President Trump's poodle. That is what is at stake at this election. It underlines the importance of stopping Brexit from happening in 17 days' time. Since the end of the Second World War, the UK has been at the heart of the European project. It was Churchill who called for a united Europe, declaring that the continent could not afford to drag forward the hatred and revenge from injuries of the past, and that the first step must be to recreate the European family of justice, mercy, and freedom. Now, while he may wish to portray himself as a Churchillian figure, Boris Johnson does a disservice to our country's great wartime leader by claiming Churchill's mantle for his own nationalist isolationist agenda. 70 years on, and our continent, once scarred by conflict and bloodshed, has healed. The EU continues to be essential for peace, security, and cooperation in our part of the global neighborhood. And the UK's economic, political, and security interests dictate that we must continue to be a member of the European Union. We share the same values, we have common interests, and we can achieve so much more together than we can alone in a global economy that doesn't recognize borders. So I simply do not understand how any political activist in our country can be neutral on this, like the leader of the opposition. And I'm proud to be led by a leader who is resolute in saying our country is stronger, safer, and better off in the EU. So what is likely to happen next? What will happen next in the Brexit story? Things will move very quickly after polling day. The next EU Council summit starts on the 12th of December when we all go to the ballot booth and the election results will be coming in whilst that EU summit is still meeting. Whoever wins may well, may well head straight to that summit and the clock will be ticking down towards the current scheduled date of departure of the 31st of January 2020. I think that's in 60 odd days time. Once you discount the Christmas break, exit day will therefore be just over a month after polling day. And two things can happen at that point. 
Sufficient numbers of MPs are elected to pass the necessary motions and legislative measures to provide for a people's vote, probably in the spring of 2020, for which the EU will grant a further extension. As the last parliament illustrated, what matters is the parliamentary arithmetic, not the wishes of any minority government. Every Liberal Democrat MP and the full weight of our party will be thrown behind Remain in that scenario. The other scenario is that Boris Johnson is giving a majority, allowing him to more or less do exactly as he pleases. He has said he will seek to bring his withdrawal agreement back to the House of Commons before Christmas, leaving little time for further scrutiny of it by the new parliament. He is clear he will see to it that we walk away from the club which we entered being dubbed as the sick man of Europe, but would leave as the world's fifth largest economy in no small part due to our membership of it. Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Rishi Sunak, let the cat out of the bag over the weekend when he said what would happen next and disclosed that regardless of whether the Prime Minister's withdrawal agreement passes, if re-elected, the Tories will continue to plan for no deal. That makes sense because it is the course they are embarked upon. They say they have an oven-ready trade deal, but it is not even half-baked. It will be impossible to conclude this free trade agreement they talk about, which is Canadian in flavour, with the EU by the end of December 2020. The Prime Minister has said he will not extend the implementation period beyond 2020. So be in no doubt, the UK will be trading on no deal, WTO terms, with the EU from 2021 under the Tories, with all the damage and fallout for our country that that will entail if they get a majority. In order to stop this calamity, and for the numbers to add up to stop Brexit in a new House of Commons, at the very least, we must reduce the numbers of Conservative MPs. All of the Conservative candidates have signed a pledge in this election to deliver this hardest of hard Brexits. Here, the Liberal Democrats have a vital and decisive role to play, because only we can take seats from the Tories in significant numbers. As John Curtis has said, given current polling, in a substantial number of seats, we are now likely to be the stronger challenger to the Conservatives. This has been borne out by the current in-seat polling. Over the last two weekends, the Observer has published seat polls in a number of constituencies that usually vote Tory, which show the Lib Dems in second place, with us po poised to beat the Conservatives, particularly if Remainers vote tactically. Conversely, the Labour Party would lose in all of them. Far from taking seats from Johnson, Labour is trying to defend its own from the Tories, particularly in the West Midlands, the North East and Yorkshire. Uh, for betting folks out there, Ladbrokes doesn't have Labour as favourite to win in any Tory-held seat, but it does with the Lib Dems. This highlights the crucial role voters have in Tory Lib Dem marginals in the coming weeks. Stopping Brexit and stopping Boris Johnson's extreme Brexit in particular is the prize. And of course, the UK deciding to remain in the EU will not only be a boost to the UK and the EU, but it will provide much needed oxygen, an injection of oxygen into the liberal international rules-based order itself, which is under threat. I've mentioned Trump, Putin, and Erdogan's disregard for it. In China, we see in Hong Kong human rights abuses, democracy, and the rule of law under attack. In Kashmir, the abolition of the region's special status by the Indian government is a cause for alarm. Across the world, nationalist populism, this pernicious mantra that says that one people is superior to another is making strides. As Matteo Silvini in Italy, Viktor Orban in Hungary, President Jair Bolsonaro undermining democracy in Brazil, the list goes on. The order is imperfect and it's got to do far better at reducing inequality and fostering a more inclusive global economic system. But we need it. It has created peace and prosperity. It has transformed states which have been aggressive autocracies, Germany and Japan, into liberal democracies. The trade it has opened up between countries has helped us ensure 
global competition no longer results in military conflict. In turn, this has helped lift millions, hundreds of millions out of poverty, and people are more healthy than before. And furthermore, the liberal democracies that fall within that order in the main also provide better protection of rights and civil liberties for their peoples than before. And NATO and the EU, as key parts of that order's architecture, have been instrumental in all of this. Now, going forward, the great challenges of the 21st century are global. The climate emergency, human trafficking, the illegal arms trade, global poverty. I do not see how we are going to tackle these issues if not through this order. Re-electing a government that aligns itself with the forces ranged against the liberal rules-based order, forces which undermine NATO, cannot be the answer. Giving free reign to a government which seeks to separate our country from the EU and so diminish Britain's capacity to cooperate with our closest neighbours in response to these threats would be a huge backward step. We offer a different course. Liberal Democrats are internationalists. This is at the heart of who we are as a party. It flows through everything that we do. So to finish where I started, under that 1941 charter, which Churchill signed, all countries would have the right to self-determination, all people the right to freedom of, its, of speech, of expression, of religion, and freedom from want and fear. The rule of law would be promoted. All nations would collaborate to improve labor standards, economic advancement, and social security for all. If you vote for the Liberal Democrats at this election, that is precisely what we are going to work to make happen. Thank you very much, everyone, and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. So I'll take some questions. Uh, who would like to go first? I'll take Tom from the BBC. Hi. Tom Simons, BBC News. Tom Simons, BBC News. Uh, both you and Joe Swinson have said in the last week that the party's being squeezed in this campaign. Was it a bad decision to start off saying that Joe Swinson could be Prime Minister? And is your response now, as you said, that it's all about the parliamentary arithmetic and Brexit? We've always said that it's all about stopping Brexit and the parliamentary arithmetic. I don't think we made a mistake. Um, our job as a party in our constitution, in an election, in a democracy, is to put forward our agenda, put forward our team, and put forward our leader as somebody that people can vote for in every single constituency, or most of the constituencies in this country. And if we started off an election campaign saying that wasn't the case, it would be rather odd. Um, but look, what is absolutely clear is that we stand to play a very decisive role on the 12th of December, and ultimately um, it will be the people who will determine just how significant that role is. Um, but what we see um, is a fact, which is that we can actually take seats from the Conservatives. We are going on the offensive to unseat the Conservatives in a number of seats, whereas the Labour Party is in a position where it's trying to defend its seats from being taken by the Tories. And if you want to stop Brexit as we do, it's vital that the numbers stack up in a new parliament for there to be a people's vote. And the starting point is depressing the numbers of Conservative MPs, and we can actually do that. Uh, Peter. Hi, thanks very much. Peter Walker from The, uh, from the, uh, from the Guardian. Um, your personal criticism of Boris Johnson is quite um, tough. Um, you're not only kind of linking into this kind of you know, right-wing group of uh, people, but you're saying that he's not uh, honest and things like that. Do you think, as a personality, he's fit to be a number 10? And do you think this is an issue that should be kind of examined more closely? I am worried that you can say and do the things that Boris Johnson has done and for people to simply dismiss it as a factor that is priced in, in this general election. I am alarmed that somebody can spew out the range of prejudice that has flowed from his mouth during his time in public office and lie again and again and again, and it should not be an issue in a general election. 
it should be an issue in a general election when you are talking about giving somebody the keys to number 10 for another five years. Uh, and so clearly, I do not believe he is fit to be prime minister. And if you look at the things he has said and done and his behavior, which follows the Donald Trump playbook, that should disqualify him from being able to be in office in my view. And it's a perfectly legitimate point for us to be making in this general election campaign. Please. Just a moment, sir. Just a moment, sir. I've, the, the lady's got the mic behind you, so I'll come to you in a moment. Hi, I'm Claire Ellicott from the Daily Mail. Um, you just talked about a people's vote rather than revoking Brexit. Does that mean this policy, the revoke policy has been abandoned and any hope of putting Joe Swinson in number 10? Uh, the revoke policy hasn't been abandoned. Uh, look, uh, just think about it. If we went from 20... MPs to 327 MPs, which would put us in a position to stop Brexit, I think it would be rather odd if we didn't immediately revoke Article 50. Um, and that is all we said in September, is that if we have a majority, that is what we will seek to do. However, we've always been clear that we will continue in all other scenarios to champion the cause that we co-founded. I co-founded um, the People's Vote campaign, and we will keep pressing for that. Uh, and that is the route uh, which it seems to me is the most likely route uh, which will enable us to stop Brexit. Uh, and obviously a big difference between us and the uh, official opposition who claim to be in favour of a people's vote as well is that our leader won't say neutral on the issue. Um, we will all be campaigning to remain in the European Union in that scenario. Okay? Uh, sir, I'll just take your question. I know. If you just, if you just take the, the mic for one moment. If you just take the mic very quickly. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, for those of us who are, have an interest in Hong Kong, the results in the recent district elections in Hong Kong have been absolutely thrilling. And the f first step on the, on the road to universal suffrage in Hong Kong, I think. That being so, and the... Uh, uh, the importance, uh, seminal event, I think, in Hong Kong. Will you be issuing any statement in support of the people of Hong Kong? 70% who voted in those district elections uh, over the weekend, uh, issuing a statement in their support, and particularly of the young people in Hong Kong who have done so much with them at demonstrations to support the territory. Thank you very much. Well. We have put out numerous statements in support of the people of Hong Kong. Uh, I met with the um, pop singer over there, Denise Ho, recently, who is a leading figure in the fight for democracy in Hong Kong. Uniquely amongst the main UK party standing at this general election, we have said that we will give all the Hong Kong people the right to a British national overseas passport and to a right of abode in the UK should they wish to take that up. That is something that we think we owe to the people of Hong Kong, um, given our long-standing commitments to them. It is a huge disappointment, and that's an understatement, frankly, that the Chinese are going back on the commitments that they made in the British Sino um, Declaration, um, which, of course, is still valid and continues to 2047. But this is an example of where you need your government not to be passive, but to be actively at the forefront of campaigning to ensure that we see the observance of human rights, international law, and democracy um, in a place like Hong Kong. If we don't step up in this type of situ situation, what message does it send to others around the world? I'll carry on. Uh, please, from PA. Um, Sean, Sean Connolly from uh, the Press Association. Um, have you been surprised by the scale of the poll squeeze that you've suffered? No. <laughs> um, I, I, th this for me is my first general election as a Liberal Democrat and uh, veterans in the party have experienced far bigger squeezes than this. I think what is clear is that in this general election we are going to see a scale of tactical voting um, that I don't think we have seen since 1997 um, because people are determined to overcome our unfair, undemocratic first past the post system, and pending actually changing that system, which we must urgently do to a system of proportional representation, people will take power into their own hands by voting tactically in this general election. And this is the point that I make, why it is so fundamental, 
what voters do in Tory Lib Dem marginals, because those are realistically the main areas where we are going to have the opportunity to reduce the numbers of Conservative MPs in the next Parliament. And if voters from other parties, Labour Remainers, swing in behind the Liberal Democrat candidate in those seats, we can unseat Conservatives in a way that the polls, the bookies and everyone is showing us the Labour Party is incapable of doing. How can I not go to Quentin, who, um, from the Times? I'm sure is going to give an extremely positive write-up uh, of morning, this pro-European uh, uh, <laughs> press uh, conference. You're, you're standing in Westminster, <clears throat> and one of the constituents in Westminster is Tony Blair. And he has apparently said he's not going to vote for you, uh, even though I think you're, you're friends, and he's going to vote for the Labour Party. Do you believe him? Have you canvassed him? <laughs> has he told you differently? Could it be possible <laughs> that he's not telling the truth? Do you know, if, if there was a person who was going to ask that question at this press conference, it was going to be Quentin Less. Um, and it's a very fair question. Um, I, I haven't, I was on the, our electric bus on the way here, um, so I didn't actually um, get to hear the audio of what um, Tony Blair said. Um, but I think what, from what I read your fellow colleagues in the lobbies report, lobby reporting him as saying, is that as a former leader of the Labour Party, he is in a very special situation but as far as he knows, everybody that he knows in the constituency will be voting for me as the strongest uh, Remain candidate in that um, election. But I'm not allowed to talk about um, any specific local situation, so I better leave it at that. Um, but um, he, you know, he, I think he was making a broader national point, um, which was arguing for voters to exercise their power tactically at this general election and essentially to back the Remain, the People's Vote <laughs> candidate in every seat. Um, I think that is highly significant for a former Labour leader to be recommending essentially that in a large number of seats um, voters should be voting for other parties and the, the biggest of the other parties that is standing in the most seats um, is the Liberal Democrats, and that is pretty significant in my view as a message to Labour voters, Labour Remainers in particular. Please. Um, Rosie Layden from British Forces Television. I just wanted to ask you about the £1 billion extra for the defence budget. Um, you're saying that's going to come out of the Remain bonus and your predictions that uh, the economy will grow more and, and therefore you'll have more money. So. I'm just wondering that if your predictions do not run as you expect, um, are you going to stay at 2% or will you increase the budget notwithstanding by that amount of money? So the commitment is to, as a minimum, uh, ensure that 2% of GDP is going to the budget, as you describe. Our forecast, well, it's not our forecast, actually. If you um, look at what the IFS is saying about... Uh, what the size of the economy will be if we stay in the European Union relative to us leaving it. It's saying that over the course of five years, by the end of the next parliament, it will be 1.9% bigger as a result of us staying in the European Union than otherwise would have been the case. And that's obviously you have a bigger economy, then there's more 2% to give to our armed forces. Um, but that the baseline for us will be 2%. And, you know, uh, uh, we'll have to see what happens um, going forward to see... Essentially, it's ba look, all, all of us are putting forward plans based on forecasts. And uh, our baseline is we will seek to stay in the European Union, and therefore that gives us access to a Remain bonus to invest in people and public services. OK? I'll take one more question. Or not. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.